tonight on Huckabee. Orders to stand down on a rescue mission. But they were furious. Proof the talking points were changed. I was stunned. As the truth on Benghazi begins to come to light, the governor asks what should have been done. And what difference at this point does it make? It matters to the friends and family of, <coughs> of Ambassador Stevens, Sean Smith, Glenn Doherty, and Tyrone Woods, who were murdered on September 11th, 2012. Benghazi victim Sean Smith's mother on why she blames the former Secretary of State. Plus, will the fallout from Benghazi blow Hillary's chances for a run for the White House? Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Mike Huckabee. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a great crowd here in New York for Mother's Day weekend. And welcome to Huckabee from the Fox News studios in New York City. All right, on Monday, I said on my radio show that I believe that the lies and cover-ups regarding what happened in Benghazi last September 11th could ultimately bring an end to Barack Obama's presidency. And I compared it to Watergate. That's in which a president was brought down by deception and a methodical attempt to cover the deception. Now, I wasn't saying that for dramatic effect or for rhetorical hyperbole, but as a recognition that Americans will forgive its leaders for mistakes, even serious mistakes, but not for intentionally, cunningly, and repeatedly lying to them and then attempting to cover the lies. The deception of the truth, added with the deflection from the truth, ends in defection of the people. Now, I wasn't the only one to go out on that limb. I was joined by former UN Ambassador John Bolton, among others, who see the handling of the Benghazi fiasco and the subsequent determination to downplay it as something that happened long ago and which doesn't matter. Well, I see it as a serious threat to the credibility of the office of the president. Among those who reacted were those who suggested that I wanted the president out of office. Let me just say that anybody who says that doesn't know me very well. I don't care much for the policies of this president, but I genuinely don't want him to be forced from office because it's not good for the country. But some of the president's strongest acolytes continue to sing the chorus that we learn nothing from the testimony of the courageous whistleblowers. Most of the Democrats in Congress circle the wagons and attack the witnesses rather than demanding honest answers of the administration. But we did learn things from the testimony. We learned that officials, including Hillary Clinton, knew from the first evening that this was a planned and orchestrated attack by Islamic terrorists, and it was not a spontaneous mob reacting to a YouTube video. We learned that multiple orders were given to the military to stand down from a rescue operation. We learned that our second-in-command in Libya was told not to cooperate with House investigators and was demoted to a desk job when he did. We learned that the so-called Accountability Review Board, often referenced by the White House and State Department to exonerate President Obama and Hillary Clinton, never even called key witnesses and didn't have a stenographer present during questioning. We found out that the security force was reduced from 30 people to six during the months preceding the attack, and while Ambassador Stevens was begging for more security, we learned that above a certain level of rank or office, no one was held accountable. We learned that talking points that were drafted and crafted to explain it all away were changed 11 times with 12 different versions. We learned that the Libyan government was so offended that we had contradicted their report of this as a terrorist attack that it delayed the FBI being allowed in to investigate for over two weeks. And most sadly, we learned that our people in Libya begged for help and we instead abandoned them. We went from a policy of no man left behind to one of no excuse left alone. Democrats, of course, scream that the concerns are nothing more than a partisan witch hunt just trying to take political advantage of a crisis. And after Tucson, Aurora, Sandy Hook, and Boston, we know that the Democrats would never try to take advantage of a tragedy and play politics with it. This isn't about being able to blame somebody for a tragedy. This is about whether we can have a government if it loses our basic trust.
Joining me now is retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, who was one of the original members of the Army's Delta Force, where he commanded elite warriors in combat operations. He also commanded the Army's Green Beret. He's participated in clandestine operations all over the world, and nobody knows more about special operations. General Boykin organized a letter signed by more than 700 special operations veterans asking the House to form a special select committee on Benghazi. Also with us today, former State Department senior advisor during the Bush administration and author of the forthcoming book, Smart Power Between Diplomacy and War, Christian Whiten. <laughs> General, I want to get right to a burning question. The administration and military officials, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said there were no assets that could have been moved in place for a rescue operation to have at least intervened. Is that, is that a realistic, honest, and plausible answer? Governor, I don't believe so. You know, we created the Delta Force and SEAL Team 6 back in the late 70s, early 80s to be able to respond to just this kind of thing. And then in the early 90s, we put in extremist forces in every theater, and their primary target was embassies. Then we have the Sixth Fleet out in the Mediterranean. And we have a variety of other assets in the, all across the southern littorals. To say we couldn't respond, I find incredible. Shame on us, but I don't believe that. Well, but some of the answers were that it might have put these folks in danger. I thought that's what they trained to do is to go into danger. Governor, when we stood these forces up that were designed to rescue people, we knew that we would never have all the intelligence we need. We knew we would go at a higher risk, but it was an issue of American values. It was the value of never leaving a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. When you are under attack, we're going to be there. That was the whole point of it. And so to say that uh, we didn't know enough to put them on. I don't buy that. I think that that is incredible, and I think somebody needs to be taken to task over that. Realistically, how long would it have likely taken to have put somebody on the ground or even overhead uh, just flying an F-16 at low altitude to scare the daylights out of somebody? How long would that likely have taken in Benghazi? Yeah, Governor, I think that, we first of all, we could have gotten aircraft there in probably uh, three to four hours. Uh, and that certainly would have helped with the second attack. Now, to get boots on the ground, I think we could have gotten them there in five or six hours. If we had really scrambled, thrown caution to the wind, and made an all-out effort to get boots on the ground to save these people, and if we couldn't save them, to bring their bodies home. All right, Christian, from a Department uh, of State perspective, talk about the protocol that happens within the department. Embassy is under attack. Who makes the call to the military to say, help us, come get us, do something. Well, it should be primarily a military decision. There are only two civilians in the chain of command, the president and the secretary of defense. But you have something called chief of mission authority, where the ambassador in a country is the head of all U.S. government employees there. Of course, that chief of mission was incapacitated, and his deputy was denied permission to act. So really a breakdown from the beginning. But we don't really know who gave those stand-down orders, although all the arrows seem to be getting closer and closer to the Obama White House. Christian, are you concerned that there is a concerted effort to, to make this seem like it was just an unfortunate incident and that nobody really is responsible, that it was just one of those days that everything went wrong? Well, sure. If you look at Jay Carney's performance yesterday, the White House spokesman, where he explained away how, you know, talking points that said this was terrorism, this was Ansar al-Sharia, the al-Qaeda affiliate in Libya, this was clearly an attack on America's ambassador by terrorists, by Islamists, how that got changed, how he just tried to explain that away. Uh, yes, clearly there is a cover-up here and clearly just a, a fiction being written. I think the press hopefully is catching on to it, though. Talk about what probably happens within the State Department and the people who work there when they see people above them running for cover and essentially saying, well, if there was any blame, it's those folks down there at the lower levels. Does that lessen the confidence of people in our State Department and make them think that, hey, I'm on my own down here. 
I think so. And it's interesting. If you look at people like Mr. Hicks, who is testifying before Congress, these are not people who you would presume to be hostile to the Obama administration. The Foreign Service, the, the career guild of diplomats that exists at the State Department is naturally Democratic and left-leaning. These people never thought they would be at a hearing that's making a Democratic administration squirm. So to take that step, they really feel upset. They really feel they're being thrown under the bus by politicos at the White House. When we come back, I'm going to talk to both of you more about what, what we can expect to see unfold over the next uh, few months and perhaps even years. This could be a while before all the layers of the onion uh, come forth. Uh, General and uh, Christian, stay with us. We'll